This week on Focus on Photography, we have Steve Brazel from BehindTheShot.tv, and we're going to take a look at what's going on with Getty Images and royalty-free photographs. This and a lot more. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. This is Focus on Photography, Episode 4, recorded on Thursday, November 14th, 2019, IT-ish. Hey folks, I am Matt Pruitt, that's Michael Woolsey, and this is Focus on Photography here on twit.tv. Hope y'all are doing well. I'm unbelievable as always. We're here just to do what we do, to sit down and talk about some of the latest and greatest tech news regarding cameras, uh, photographies, rumors, all of that wonderful stuff that's just going to just tickle your fancy and give you your fix for the world of photography and photography news. The difference is today we have a guest on set. Wow. If you're, look, if you're looking at the live stream, you can see <laughs> we have Mr. Steve Brazel joining us today. Mr. Street, Steve Brazel is an outstanding photographer. I'm not going to do a full interview or anything like that, but he's an outstanding photographer that shoots concerts, amongst other things. And he also hosts his own podcast called Behind the Shot. Mr. Steve, welcome. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good morning to you. Doing well, doing well. Mr. Woozy, how you be today? I'm good. I'm blessed. Good, good, good. good <laughs> Can I start you. with something? Oh. Oh, 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 well, sure. Go right ahead. I, I have to, first of all, thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. But I don't know that anybody's been here to say congratulations on the new show. The first three episodes were absolutely fantastic. <gasps> oh, Hopefully wow. I don't bring down episode four. Oh, no, 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 no. Man. Man, is he is he just trying to make us blush right now? Is, is that uh, what that is? No, but yeah. it's true. <laughs> I've shared him online, and I don't share it unless I like it. So oh, it's, it's great. You, you guys so are doing really good work. We thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, this show focus on photography. We we don't want to call this an interview show, if you will. Me and Wolves, we want to sit down and just talk about what's going on in the photography world, what's going on from a rumor standpoint, and also just talk about some of the things that we're working on day to day and just general day in the life of a photographer out there trying to get it done and, 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 you know, get the bills paid, if you will, just to be quite honest. Right. Right. And also to meet new people like you, Steve. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and exactly. Just, that's why I grow the community. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that's another thing that the whole community aspect of it from photography is, is it's dwindling in my opinion. And I'd like for us to be a part of, you know, trying to grow it back because at one point in time, the photography community was so locked down and nobody wanted to quote unquote, share their secrets on how to get this shot done. And, and I think we're finally starting to see a shift mm-hmm. of the of things opening up a little bit more. And I want to be a part of, you know, that uptick to mm-hmm. get more people involved and get more people shooting regardless of what camera you have. I don't care if it's a point and shoot. I don't care if it's your thousand dollar iPhone. I I don't care if it's your old iPhone. Just go on out there, start shooting and snapping some photos. Well, and and I actually think, I I think the community has gotten smaller, but I actually think it's gotten tighter. It's getting tighter. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there really is this feeling of we're kind of all in it together and, and we've already got When you meet another photographer, like when you went to Adobe Max, I'm sure it happened. When you meet another photographer, there's this instant, we already have something in common feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, now that's, that's something I didn't mention on our last show for um, where we talked about Adobe Max. But when I was there, you know, you're meeting a bunch of different designers and photographers and so forth. But the beauty of it was when I met another photographer, they didn't ask me what camera I was using. Uh, right. Uh, they didn't ask me, you know, what what's your favorite app? They just asked, when's the last time you shot? You know, uh, how did it go for you? Did it feel good? What your, projects you are you know, working on? Yeah, what are you working on? Mm-hmm. Can I help you with that? You know, it's that's the community yep. that, that I want to, to, cons- to see grow. Right. You know? And I think that community is out there, like you said, Steve. It's just it's um, a matter of finding the you know finding the right people who are actually uh, capable of uh, being a little bit more open, mm-hmm. and um, who uh, and not everybody's going to be um, be like minded, right? But if you're working on some projects which some somebody else is going to be connected to, right. I think that's just where the the beauty comes in. You know, oh, yeah. where people yeah. can lend lend different information or just kind of give some insights. Definitely, definitely agreed. 
All right. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start out the show with just going over a couple news items, rumors items, and so forth before we get into the meat of breaking down who is Mr. Steve Brazel and breaking down what Mr. Woolsey has gotten himself into this last week. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look at our first item. And this one is uh, fairly near and dear to my heart as Getty Images is now going all royalty free with its services. Uh, if you're a photographer and you've huh. been shooting stock images and, and handling rights managed photography, your image could only be used with this person or, you know, setting up whatever your license would be for a particular client, particular brand or what have you. This is pretty big because you're going royalty free and that image that you took as the, the hero shot or what have you, it could be seen any and everywhere now and possibly decrease a little bit of money that you made or possibly increase a little bit of money that you made. What are your thoughts on it? Um, I, I, man, that's a, that's a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big thought. And um, Getty being, you know, one of the, the, the largest out there from the, from the, the, the photography library standpoint of, of where people are going to get their images. I don't care what newspaper you read or magazine mm -hmm. that you read. It seems like a lot of times it's got a little Getty image logo. Well, at the but here's a key part of that. Mm -hmm. This does not affect editorial. Right. So That's this right. is editorial subscription is stock photography. Yeah. It's not editorial. So like I have a bunch of friends who shoot Getty mm -hmm. usually in the live music space. Mm -hmm. Right. And I reached out to a couple to just ask their thoughts of this. And the first thing they said to me was that doesn't affect me. Okay. So the editorial people are fine. That sounds yes. good. Well, for now, right? <laughs> it's Getty. <laughs> you never know, but for now they're fine. Yeah. I've had a few images of mine go through Getty's, uh, royalty free and it was fine. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was pretty cool to see that my images had an extra little leg on it. You mm -hmm. know, it could get out and reach somebody right. else. But a lot of people are against services like that because they think my images are worth more and I should be paid more and not just be nickeled and dimed, if you will, for royalty free stock services. Have you have you, you know, used stock services? You know, rules? to be honest with you, I have never used stock services. Mm -hmm. um, and I looked into it and but I, I just I don't know if I was that um, I felt it was a little bit too like too vulnerable. Like yeah. The images out there and. And that um, I would lose control, but um, at the same time, I don't mind if people use the images. Uh, it's just a matter of um, where is it going to, how it's going to be used, um, <laughs> and well, it's, a, and it's a personal thing, actually. I think, and mm -hmm. I just uh, and and the interesting thing about this to me is this goes back a couple of years. I mean, don't you agree? We've kind of seen the writing on the wall for this, yeah. right? Because you've got sites like Unsplash and Pixabay and sites like this where people were giving images away for free. Mm -hmm. And it was okay early on because you had people that were sharing images for free on the Unsplash, which I've, I was not a fan of in that, mm -hmm. that model, but <clears throat> they were able to do that. And it was, it didn't so much affect rights managed because rights managed were images that were going to larger companies right, the that had brands. exclusivity rights, mm -hmm. which was a, a, a huge boost in the cost. It had, you know, time restrictions. You've licensed it for one year or something like that. But really with the places like Unsplash, this has kind of been on the wall to me that this was going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten into the stock photography years ago. Um, more so with just using smartphone images because it was so mm, easy to right. create them. And you could create something just totally random, like this half drink <laughs> cup of coffee. Someone could use that for a blog or what mm -hmm. have you. And I'm thinking, oh, I can just throw it out there and make a dollar or two or whatever. It, right. it, just, it just didn't bother me because I didn't have to put a ton of thought in it and a ton of effort in it. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to get a little more serious just to see if I could make some more money and put a little more effort in it and stage in some things mm -hmm. and put them up on different services, whether it's Adobe stock or Shutterstock or Getty, what have you. And I've learned that, you know what, I'm not going to make a ton of money on this right, right now, right. but it was enough to make beer money. <laughs> you know, it was enough to make steak money mm -hmm. and it was enough. To Nothing wrong with beer money. Right, <laughs> right. It was enough for that. And it was 
pretty much just, you know, it's passive income. Right. I don't think about uh, it. Once I, yeah. once I put it out there, it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I don't it's mailbox think, money. Right. right. It just shows up once a month kind of thing. It, it was it was fine. I, but I have it, a question for both of you. Yeah, go ahead. Do you think it'll work in the sense of, obviously, they're trying to make up the, the money getting made on those licenses. They're trying to make it up on volume oh, of royalty free. Can they? I don't know because it's so diluted out there, you know. And how many images? <laughs> and how many images do they have, anyways? I and mean, they, they, I, w I, I'd be interested to see uh, to know how many images does Getty have. I mean, that's hundreds of thousands. Yeah, and if not a million, for all I know, because no, I know I looked it up. Pixabay, which is like Unsplash, if you don't know about Pixabay, Pixabay's got seven hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, some of these. Yeah, some of these services are close to a million. When you go in there and look, I know like Adobe, <clears throat> excuse me, I know like Adobe stock has right at a million images mm -hmm. and mine are mixed in there between yeah. a million images. And it's so random if one of yours gets picked up. Right. Yeah. You know, so it, it's so diluted in that in that field. But it, it if you play your cards right, you could make, like I said, decent beer money every month and not really think about it it just sort of shows up it's interesting i i, I work in a um, editorial and as well as uh, personal work or yep. documentary or, or even you know, corporate work and i uh, can't really put those works into the right. kind of um the getty right um aspect but even the personal work i i, I it's personal so i don't want to have it go out there mm -hmm. in that way now, you, you mentioned something earlier. You, you talked about control. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, well. I have a story on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was one, one day I decided to, to do stock images and use myself as the model. Oh, okay. nice. So when you're doing stock images of people, you better get a model release, period. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. you know, so as a matter of fact, I have model releases in my backpack at all times, mm -hmm. just in case. Actual paper ones? Yes, Smart. Just in case I'm out just doing a random street photography shoot mm -hmm. and something really, really strikes me and I'll, I'll have that and I'll say, hey, look, I, I, I actually did this a couple of times. You know, I, I saw someone out in the city and it just worked. The lighting was great. The mm -hmm. mood was great. I snapped it. I went over to him, you know, and sort of diffused it. Say, look, <laughs> I'm a photographer. You just look great in this situation. If I, do you mind me sharing this? And they're like, yeah, sure, share it. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, do you mind me sharing it and using it in the gallery? And if I could make profit off of it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sure. I said, right. okay, well, can you please sign this? Mm -hmm. And I will send you copies of this, yada, 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 for your records. And, you know. Well, I'm glad you're very transparent. Like I'm that. clear about yeah, it. Yeah, that's very good. You know, but. Did you, did, I'm curious, when you did that. Mm -hmm. I wish more people would do that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you did that, did you take a photo of them holding uh, the signed release so that you can ID which photo goes to which paper. I see what you're that I did not do. Um, but fortunately I haven't had to mix anything up like that. I typically will manage the files on my phone in the cloud. And then when I get back to the desk, it's all mm -hmm. squared away. Yeah. You know, but yeah. Um, so yeah, this, I wanted to use myself for this particular shot that I had in mind because, you know, I, I can sign my own model release and, I, you know, whatever. Plus, you're a good looking guy. Yeah, and plus, I'm, I'm a good looking dude, <laughs> man. You know? <laughs> so I, I snapped oh, a couple of images. Like I snapped a couple of images of myself. Um, one was like a, a, a fitness pose or whatever. Doesn't show my face or anything, but it's a fitness pose. Mm. And that shot got picked up a couple of times. And the one nice. time, one of the times that I saw it, I found it on a website. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, oh, boy. Yeah, it, it was really, a really, really personal. Now, how site. proud I'll are you right that. now? How proud are you right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the only saving grace is I know my face isn't there. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, geez. But I see it and I'm like, that's my shot and mm. that's me. But. Hey, whatever they paid for it. I have a, <laughs> I have a, yeah, I have a story where um, I did a um, a uh, doc, kind of documented a, um, a would call a uh, a fitness gym here in uh, mm -hmm. town, and um, and so they put up on the website, and then um, somebody from Brazil was down there, and they saw uh, in the gym. On the wall, one of my uh, uh, images, all, all uh, like huge, <laughs> on the wall. I was thinking, that's. 
I wasn't offended or anything like that. I thought that was pretty cool right. you know, that somebody had like the yep. kind of put that out there like that. But um, but I, I think what I'm trying to say is that you never know where images are going to go or how they're going to be used. Yes. You know, sometimes true. it's used nicely mm-hmm. and sometimes it's used. Yeah, it was it was interesting. I'll just well, say and, and it. Think it was about really it. personal. <laughs> When when Aunt, when you made that shot, see now you're thinking I should have turned the photographer down and not signed the release. Mm-hmm. When you're when you are uh, when you're making that shot, mm-hmm. you envision a certain use model. But it's amazing what a marketing director, what right. a director of photography mm-hmm. might look at stock photography. Mm-hmm. You know, or I'll go at the radio station I work at. We have uh, subscriptions to to you know AP and Getty and things like that, right. so that we don't illegally use photos in a blog post. Right. And you'd be surprised the connection some people writing a blog post make when they see a picture mm-hmm. that's in their subscription service that you and I would never connect to that story. Mm-hmm. Right. And they do. You never know where your pictures are going to end up. But to me, this Getty thing, I think it was on the wall. And and I really think for Getty, this is a good thing. Mm-hmm. For contributors, it's bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, mm-hmm. Getty is still a business, right? Right. Getty is still, ha- they still have to worry about profit at the end of the, each quarter. So they're going to do what they need to do. And I respect that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think the other part of it too, is that, um, I not ha, they have a beautiful museum down here and that's, uh, folk and you're a uh, neck of the uh, wood, Steve. Um, and it seems like they do a very nice job of supporting mm-hmm. photographers, um, in, in a way that's, um, you know, respectable, respectable. Will. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Well, I, I just wanted to toss that out there and get your guys' thoughts on it. Uh, a lot of people are up in arms on this, but again, if you're editorial, you, you, you're you going to be fine. So, all right. So moving right along, I want to get into something near and dear to uh, <laughs> to Mr. Brazel's heart. There's a rumor of Olympus shutting down its camera division. Oh, wow. A rumor. A rumor. Okay. Let's just make sure we're clear. Right, right. Rumor. That. Yeah. We'll make, make sure we're clear on that. Um, huh. And it came from a website that I didn't necessarily put a lot of faith in, but yet everybody seems to be linking to them. Um, personally, I, I don't see a reason for this to be a, a fact or, or, you know, factual or true or anything like that. Uh, I think Olympus is still going to be fine. They've been around for, what, about 100 years um, yeah, so. and they're way more than their cameras. <laughs> right. It, it, yeah. yeah, well, the, yeah, copiers and whatnot. All right, so they, I think they're going to be fine um, and could still keep their camera division uh, sort of like how Apple does with its, uh, like, Apple TV and keep it as sort of, like, hobby. You know, it, it's still there and available. We'll put some resources over there, but we got bigger fish to fry. Uh, well, well, their imaging and their scientific uh, solutions divisions are their biggest, and I think their their medical tech stuff yeah, and, is their most profitable. So this is minor to them. I Had you heard of this website, Personal View, before? No. <laughs> people are giving it, I mean, people are arguing with it. Right. 43 rumors said that the story is is nuts, and that's not the phrase they used, but they, you know, nuts. <laughs> um, but the admin, when he posted it, said closure of the camera division is near in less than eight months, and a press release will go out in January to March. Um, Sony or Samsung, this was interesting, this Sony or Samsung could pick up the team or the equipment, which was interesting. But they just announced an, an EM5 Mark III. Right. <laughs> so, They've so. got, I was looking up market share. Mm. In Japan alone, just Japan, this is of as of June 2019, BCN ranking for mirrorless market share in Japan. Uh, Canon's got 31%. Mm. Sony's got 30%. Olympus has 21% and Panasonic has 10 They're right there with them. Wow. Right there with them. Hmm. So, it, it, I mean... <laughs> They're and not I going think those anywhere. are mirrorless numbers are better than overall because I think when you get into DSLRs and add those into the mix, they're going to drop way down. Yeah, but in course. the mirrorless share, at least in Japan, they're not hurting. Yeah, I I, huh. I saw this and I was like, no, this can't be true. So I dug into it a little bit more. But again, that that particular personal view, whatever that website is called, I I, I can't put any faith in it. But yet, a lot of the uh, photography pundits out there are linking back to them and giving them a little bit of how old light is, to shine. How old is this uh, uh, website? The site, November not, 10th. 
No, oh, the, the oh, site itself. I'm site not itself? sure. Okay. Oh, the site. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm yeah. not sure. But this was here's a question. I, I'm curious. If if this happened, which I don't believe it would. Nope. Right. And I know people who shoot Olympus. Andy I don't Nacco believe it'll shoots happen. Olympus. In, in Scott Bourne is is an Olympus. I don't know what they call him. Ambassador in Karen Hutton. Karen Hutton. She's uh, another one. If Olympus went under, would Samsung or Sony buy their stuff? Well, what technology can they share? Or what um, go ahead, Woolsey. Well, I, I think um, like all those companies you just uh, named, their their technology is so superior. And I'm just wondering how Olympus uh, technology is compared to theirs. Right. What, what, would they, that, what would Samsung and Sony get out of an aqua hire, right. if you will? And, and I don't see that they would get much. Maybe if anybody, Samsung. Patents, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's thinking long game. So, yeah. Mm. But I, I, I doubt it happened, though. Yeah, I just I just don't see it. I mean, if something happens with Olympus, it's not going to be, in my opinion, it's not going to be in a year. It's not even going to be in five years. It's because they have so much going for them amongst other things that they could still funnel in resources into their camera division mm -hmm. if need be, you know. But that's my two cents. I'm not a financial analyst or anything like that, nor do I claim to be. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more one more thing here that I wanted to touch on. Uh, and that is Instagram has now started rolling out its lack of using likes in its services. Now, I know Mr. Wools is on Instagram. Uh -huh. I know That's Mr. Browser is on Instagram. I'm on there. But people in the photography world, I've learned to use Instagram totally different from, from everybody else. So when I use Instagram, it's more of a, I had to make it more of a marketing Thing for me and my my what I can offer to people back home mm -hmm. before I moved out here um, so I pushed a lot out there because people wanted to see Instagram metrics for whatever reason mm -hmm. they didn't believe I was good at my job until they saw something on Instagram okay you there know you what go. I'm saying so mm -hmm. I had to really push that now that like button had a lot of power to people mm -hmm. it didn't have a lot of power to me but it had a lot of power to prospective clients that I was you know, trying to work. Right. right. So for me personally, like button goes away. Yeah. Have at it. Bye. You know, thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. It's all good. What are your thoughts? So they're saying that they're going to take away the like, take button? away the like button. They've already started testing it in Australia and Germany. And, um, now they're rolling it. Brazil, to this, Canada, it's, right. It's rolling its way to Canada. But and what's it's the purpose though? What's the purpose of that? That was the interesting part of, of this whole story to me was yeah. it was a corporation that's, Owned by Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. That is basically saying they want to make it less of a competition. Uh -huh. They want to make it a safer environment, safer uh, because. Environment. And and this is actually really interesting. Mm -hmm. There was a quote, in fact, from the CEO I found fascinating. But the the basic concept is when you get likes, and when specifically the viewers see the like number, because when they do this, when they remove the like. They're not removing the like button. Right. They're it's removing that the, the users visibility. see the likes. Right. Oh, you as the maker okay. that posted the picture will still see the likes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's just nobody else does. The public visibility. And <laughs> their idea is if you're if if you are showing your like numbers to people, you're gonna program more controversy. Right? You're programming to get likes and have people see that you got ten thousand likes. Mm. So they think it'll be safer. And here was the interesting quote from the CEO, Adam Mosiri. Mosiri. Yep. We're going to put a 15-year-old kid's interests before a public speaker's interests. When we look at the world of public content, we're going to put people in that world before organizations and corporations. And all that hit me was you're owned by Facebook. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I get what they're saying because back home in Charlotte uh, – over the last, I believe it's three or four years, we've had youth suicide issues. Um, okay. And so, and a lot of that stuff stems from uh, mental health and depression, things of that mm -hmm. nature. And then it digs deeper into the social media side of it. 
right. these kids social are, acceptance. Right. These kids are, are just hungry for likes. They're hungry for, you know, the comments mm-hmm. and all of that interaction, Snapchat. even though it, right. Even though it really doesn't mean anything, mm-hmm. but these kids are clearly affected by how many likes they get. And it really, wow, that's really interesting. I had no, I, I guess because I use it from a different perspective, you use it differently. Right. And right. so I, okay. I, so I, how do you use it, Michael? I use it to, um, if I like a piece or, or um, a photograph mm-hmm. and um, feel, like we were talking about a box of 20. I don't know. If yeah. you, that's part of kind of like the new, yeah, just a, an image that I love to put up and share. Mm-hmm. Um, whether I get likes or not on it, it's um, one thing or another, right. uh, but um <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know yeah. in regards to if it really matters that much. Um, Based on what I know about you, the likes do not matter to you. Right. You know, and, and I and I totally respect that, you know, but you, you're putting it out there. Again, it sounds like a little bit of marketing, but more so for you to watch your progression. You know? Exactly. Right. Yes. And, and and that's totally fine. It's your that's your space. That's mm-hmm. your platform. You use it however the heck you want to use it. Right. But I didn't uh, think about it as a uh, um, youth using it in that way that you're talking about it. And I, I would think that Snapchat, you know, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another one. Right. That's yeah. um, kind of uh, where you see kids to take and photograph of themselves mm-hmm. and put on Snapchat. Yeah. Uh, just for streaks. I think that's what they call it. They had streaks or something. Right. I believe my kids. I, see, I think this will have some really cool kind of side effects. Mm-hmm. If you're programming for likes, you're either going to be more outrageous Okay. or more safe. Hmm. Hmm. I think if you're not programming for likes, you may have creatives like us mm-hmm. get a little more uh, risky, right? It could drive more creative content because you're not worried nobody's going to see that it only got three likes. So you might you might risk posting stuff that you would normally not post. The other thing is, hmm. I think even okay. though the like button is still there, mm-hmm. I think it'll get used less because if you don't see the number as the end user, there's going to be less motivation for you to click it. So the likes will go down. But because I, as the creator, still see the number, I don't think it takes away that that addiction for somebody that wants them, at which point you're going to end up with depressed people. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it's, it's, it, it seems yeah, like it's, it can it's, go it's, both ways. It's a... It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting topic, really. I, I'd, I'd rather they just did away with it. Completely. I'd rather they just totally wipe it out. But at the same time, I look at those. Oh, that's interesting. 1.2 million viewed your content, only three likes. Yeah, and, and that happens a lot, too. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a whole different metric there. We mm-hmm. can get in that. Wait, what was that? In the chat room, uh Bleep oh, I got it up here. 1.2 million views, your content, <laughs> but only three likes. And I've seen a lot of that on some of my content. It's just, it'll have a ton of views, but the like analytics are down. Right. And it, it's, I don't get it, but I don't worry about it anymore. Right. I used to, but, but, but I don't bleep bl- blurb, bleep blurb in the chat room is right. I mean, yeah. that theoretically could happen. Right. 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 And uh, what was I saying? I just lost my thought. That gum it. Um, <laughs> that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do on air. Um, but yeah, it, it, I personally would not have a problem with it going away. But I'd link, I think about the brands out there and I think about the quote unquote influencers out there that actually get oh, paid. Okay. Yeah, that's on, a totally different situation. You know, they get paid based on their following. They get paid based on their impressions and they get paid based on their, uh, their likes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of them can be up in arms about, Hey, you're cutting out my money. And part of it I can see because I've been burned in the past mm-hmm. because I quote, didn't have enough subscribers or didn't have enough likes, didn't have enough followers. Mm-hmm. I've been burned from a job to say, no, we're, we're going to go with this other person. Right. Never mind the fact that that other person could have clearly just bought likes, bought followers mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So yeah, for me, I'm like, get, just get it out of here because it, it can be totally inflated and fake, you know, even though there are some people that are genuinely really good at their you know, their craft and they've earned every single bit of those likes and earned every one of those followers. Mm-hmm. I get it. There's a, um, 
an agency that I'm aware of that um, they're bidding um, bidding on a job, and the part of the bidding process, the um, the client, the prospective client, looked at their social media, and um, and uh, they said that they are iffy because the uh, there was not enough um, information or enough uh, content mm -hmm. on the social media. And uh, I wonder how uh, prospective clients look at the likes. And like, it, it, it varies from, from client to client, brand to brand. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been able to get some gigs where people could give a crap about my social media. Mm -hmm. And I'm, right. I'm totally thankful for that. They, they gave a crap about me, my engagement with them, and, and if I could just flat out get the job done. Right. You know, and then there was others that said, mm, yeah, maybe we'll give you a shot. Well, and <laughs> I think some some people who would hire an influencer or for that matter, any any creative are going to know the difference between you have a large amount of followers that may or may not be engaged. Mm -hmm. Right. And you have less followers. Right. But my gosh, they're engaged. That's right. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, I've seen that in radio where I, I've worked at a very big station in Detroit and our sister station was a little teeny AM station that mm -hmm. was programmed way different than us. But advertisers knew that people who listened to that AM station never hit the button. <laughs> right. So they'd make <laughs> more so profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it really, I, I think it can be a benefit to some people. The, the people here, if they take away the public view, but you can still get numbers an influencer can still show them, but the likes may drop, but you'll still have a baseline of everybody dropping. Mm hmm. If you do away with them totally, yeah, you'll hurt influencers. Hmm. Yeah, I'm hoping that I can get in touch with um, a couple influencers that I know. And by influencers that I know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of people that I know put into work every single day mm -hmm. and that have earned every accolade that they have, not right. just gone out and bought them. Because there are some that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, and just tickle, you know, just tickle their brain and see what they think about it and because I know it's been on their radar. I know their management team has been talking to them right. about it and what are we going to do? And the thing is, they're probably going to be okay because they've already established their brand. Mm -hmm. You know, so their their brand is out there regardless of Instagram existing. Or right. Not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That makes sense to you? Yes. Makes total sense to me. Yeah. You know, so. We'll I see. mean, if, if you're established, you're established. Right. But this will make, you know, there's, get away from the creatives you brought it up and at the beginning, mm -hmm. there are businesses that use these tools for marketing mm -hmm. and they're going to have to reevaluate. I mean, they can still market, they can still do ad posts, mm -hmm. but they're going to have to reevaluate how they evaluate the success of those ads. Oh, right. Because that budget is, is, is based on is like, based on how that thing yeah, is based on that. So they're going to, you know, th those marketing teams are going to have to sit back and just redo their baselines to understand what success is. Mm. Man, this is going to be interesting. Analytics. They're going to be rolling yeah, this exactly. out soon. It's not going to hit us tomorrow, but they are starting to roll out. And again, from my perspective, kudos to Instagram for, you know, trying to at least hide it some and, and help out. But we'll, we'll see how all this stuff works out. We'll see. And I oddly believe that 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 quote from the CEO is authentic. I really believe yeah. the people who run Instagram are seeing some of those addictions as it were, and they're, they're trying to address it. And, and that's awesome. Mm. Dude, I, I'm going to speak personally. I I've seen my own children go out there and say, Hey, make sure you go like this. Oh, uh -huh. and I get it. And then I was like, Oh no, I don't want them to be that way. Mm -hmm. I, I want them to just, just share the work kind of thing. But that's just the nature of those kids. That's just the nature mm -hmm. of the, the kids of today, I should say. And we, we really need to try to get a handle on that because I don't want my kids to be down and out because the like, the like mark went down. They didn't get as many this week. Because I, yes, right. I have mental health issues in my family. So I, I try to stay mindful of that stuff. Right. And, and, you know, I've worked with them and they're fine now. They, they, they don't worry about that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. But I can remember at one time there was like, Hey, make sure y'all go like this, go like this, go mm -hmm. like this. And I'm like, do what? Right. But when I looked at the, the big picture, everybody in their circle felt that way, mm -hmm. you know? And then I looked beyond that, everybody outside of that circle, it was just like a whole societal thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, just kids being kids. 
Exactly. Well, it's a really uh, interesting issue, though, though. It's um, not only do you have your the people that you see are friends, but then you have your social network friends. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge issue in regards to how um, people's self-esteem is based on such a thing. And especially when you're really young, mm-hmm. um, I'm the social uh, social networking or social um, you know, we call networking is just amazingly complex at this time. <laughs> it is complex. Well, it, is it, an it, it's an interesting <laughs> intersection of you. Just Michael made an interesting point. You have your friends, mm-hmm. and then you have your social friends, and to some people, those blur. Right. Right. I mean, I remember one time because of stuff somebody was posting, I unfriended them on Facebook. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And they didn't realize it right away. Right. I only unfriended him on Facebook. Right. One of my original karate instructors. Love the guy, right? Right. But two months later, I get a phone call. Did you unfriend me on Facebook? Oh, jeez. People. And I went, on. well, yeah, but that's Facebook. That's not real life. Right. I don't want to see, see that on my screen. I just didn't want to see what you were posting. Yeah. yeah. And we haven't spoken since. Oh, mm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you know, But you know what I mean? Some people do mix that. So right. I, I, you know, like you said, Ann, I think, I think looking at it from the mental health point of view, is a good thing. I think that a company is willing to do that is mm-hmm. is awesome. Right. All right. So let's um let's go ahead and transition. I wanted to look at one more thing that Mr. Brazel brought up uh, in our rundown, and this is dealing with Lightroom. You mm-hmm. know, I, I had to give Wools some crap a couple episodes ago <laughs> because this dude is a photographer and is out there killing it. And has yet to use Lightroom on his daggum iPhone. Really? Right. He finally got into it now. So I use Snapseed. <laughs> and and yes, yeah, Snapseed okay. is great. And now you know where I'm going. I'm with Michael on this yeah, one. Snapseed is great. Uh-huh. I, I I give you that. But I'm like, man, you're an Adobe user. Why not at least try Lightroom on the you know, and he just huh? Lightroom? But, yeah. Okay. If well. it, I, I come from the uh, point of view of it ain't broken, don't fix no, it. I feel you. I feel, <laughs> and, that, and that's and that's why I love you, Wolves. Man, that's I love this guy. But uh yeah, what you you wanna talk about this here? Uh, Lightroom having a recent um, leak, if you will, um, displaying that we can now, on the, on the iOS side of things, import directly from external storage into your iPad or your iPhone. So if you have like a, a, a little thumb drive or something like that and you have images, you can pull them in from that external drive into your phone and work on them on your, own, on your iPhone or on your iPad fairly easily. Wow. This is something that's been needed for quite a while for, hmm. for those on the go mobile editors. I'm not that guy. Um, so it didn't really trip my trigger, but I know a lot of people that are really trying to move towards. See, and, and that's editing. my question to you. Mm-hmm. Who is the guy? Because when I saw this and there's a video that, you know, shows them demoing it yep. and you can put a memory card in and go straight into Lightroom. And what does Lightroom do? Upload them to the cloud. That's all they did. <laughs> and then he edits them. He does a lot of edits and it's mm-hmm. awesome. Mm-hmm. But I don't like one of the things that's even with with uh, uh, Photoshop for iPad. I'm the same way. I don't want to use the Adobe cloud for my images. Mm-hmm. When I go shoot a festival for a weekend, I have thousands of images. Yeah. I don't want to import those. If I just need, uh, as an example, when I shoot a concert for a venue mm-hmm. and they'll look at me and say, we need one or two shots for social media right away. OK, no problem. First of all, with Lightroom, I could have put my media in through the OS, put it into the Files app or put it into the Photos app and brought it into Lightroom, edited it the way that I wanted. This is just the direct path. Right. But when you do that, then they upload, which I may not want them to do. And takes away from your storage that you're paying for. And that's where Snapseed to me comes in, Mm -hmm. is I use Wi-Fi on my 5D Mark IV. Mm -hmm. I pull up my iPad or my iPhone. I Wi-Fi one or two pictures over. I open them in Snapseed. I edit them. I literally airdrop them to the to the Live Nation rep, and they're on social media. Yeah, that's so. I'm awesome. wondering who needs to import Thousands. enough photos at a time, not just one, right? Mm-hmm. Enough photos at a time that this is is the top of their bucket list and wish list. Mm. Who is that photographer? I, I I don't know because I know it's not me. Um, I'll embrace mobile editing here and there for reasons just like you said, Mr. Brazel, is is every now and then you want to get that quick shot from the shoot up for social media purposes, mm-hmm. for marketing purposes. Because a the teaser. Client, yeah, because the client, they're requested. I think 
Wolves and I talked about that a couple of weeks ago when he was working in uh, Pennsylvania, right? Mm-hmm. And I asked you, are there times when, you know, a client is like, okay, I need you to get this shot and have it ready and so I can get it up to, to marketing or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've been there, you know, I did, some people, they just want that. I'd rather let me just shoot and worry about all of that stuff later. Mm-hmm. But every now and then there's going to be that client that's like, hey, I, I need this out now because that's, they're trying to build their business too. Right. You, you know, know? The, um, there's this one story that I um, kind of been thinking about the, mm-hmm. um, with this, um, this topic. There's this famous photograph of uh, when um, in Princess Diana uh, who uh, funeral and where there's this AP photographer who snapped a photograph of, uh, I think it was Prince William. Mm-hmm. He actually worked on it and sent it off like within five minutes and it became the image throughout the world. So this is kind of like the thing where if there's that kind of image, there's that chance that you want to work on it right away and send but you it. could do that anyway. Right. You could bring it into photos or files and then into, I mean, granted, I, I understand an extra steps, an extra step. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying this is great. I know people will use it. There's no question. People will mm-hmm. use it. Yeah. I just don't see it as the hill that they, the first hill I wish they'd gone over. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. I, I, I agree with you on that. I agree. When I, when I got that news in my inbox, I was like, huh, that's cool. But it didn't necessarily excite me, if you will. Exactly. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I'm already transferring files using Wi-Fi from the camera. Yeah, it's that's, like, a, that's a, like another step, though. I don't I don't get it. I, it just seems like a very big, um, a lo, I, it just seems like it's um I, I would just take it uh, to my studio and just work on the uh, images. <laughs> or gonna, you'd have your laptop with you, yeah. put yeah. the card in the laptop. Exactly work right. On yeah. It. And, I, right. I, and, and then work airdrop on, it to your phone. Right. And I can't, I can't work on a screen like that. Can you, Steve? <laughs> Like I, um, and I do, I do in Snapseed. Yes, oh, Snapseed. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, I, absolutely. But I do it I mean, for the quick I, job. I've done Snapseed, where I, I, okay, so it's on a small screen, right? So you think to yourself, it looks good enough. I'll give it to him. And then you get back and you look at it full screen and go, wow, Oops. that actually came out really good. Now I want to try and recreate that on oh, the raw file mm-hmm. in Lightroom, and can never get it to match. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I've had some of those scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll do one more story before we dig into Mr. Brazel and things that he's been doing and getting up to. So lastly, I want to touch on Filmic. I don't know if you, if you folks have heard of Filmic. Um, I've used Filmic in the past for video projects, uh, especially um, if I wanted to shoot something with my phone and put it on a gimbal. Filmic Pro was an outstanding app. Um that allowed me to put in different manual settings and, and, and use the actual mobile gimbals hardware to handle focus and handle other little settings while you're shooting. It's like, out like DJI it's kind amazing. of stuff. Right. No, you can use DJI with this. You can use the, the DJI, um, uh, pocket. what's it called? You can use the pocket, no, you can pocket, use the I'm Osmo, sorry, the, the mobile, the Osmo, Osmo mobile, and you can use the June Z- smooth four. That's mm-hmm. the one that I have. I have both. Actually, I have both of them. I have the, the Osmo and I have the Smooth 4. But I like the Smooth 4 better mm-hmm. because that app seems to work just a lot better with the controls on it. I mean, like focus pulling and things like that. It's so intuitive. And the app is 15 bucks. I remember when I saw that, I was like, man, 15 bucks for an app? That's a little bizarre. But when I bought it, I get it. Uh-huh. It's totally worth it. Now, Filmic has put out a new app called First Light. This is focusing more on photography. Right now, it's only available on iOS. But what I do like about it is they're giving you all of those extra features that Filmic Pro is giving you as far as having different readouts, uh, focus peaking, and, 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 and the zebras, and just more manual control that you have on this $1,000 iPhone that you're carrying around. And it'll utilize all of the different lenses on the iPhone and uh, just help you be able to create even more awesome content. Now, it's a free app, Mm -hmm. but you're going to have some limited capabilities with the free version. So you have to either sign up for the subscription of $8 a year or just keep the free app. And I think $8 a year is pretty fair based on some of the stuff I've seen. Mm -hmm. I wish I could see something like this on the Android side, which is probably coming soon. I'll put some I'll put some links to this information in the show notes, but I thought this was a pretty 
fascinating bit of news because of how well I've worked with filmic in the past from a video standpoint. Mm -hmm. And now having this on the, the photography side, seems like it'd be a pretty good, pretty good uh, tool to use. Right, right. Have you guys seen that? Um, no. I've used filmic pro mm -hmm. and filmic pro. One of the things that I think speaks to the company and their development is if you pull out your iPhone at a concert and you try and film, like oh. I did this with my son's band, the audio sounds horrible. It clips. Filmic Pro has a limiter in it, mm -hmm. and it works amazingly well. Mm -hmm. And I just thought how simple that is that they did that. And, it's and I can record when you video in front of the stage. Say again? And it's intuitive while you're watching it on the screen. You can, you can it's see It's intuitive everything. while you're watching it on the screen. So for <laughs> them to bring that to photography and an, uh, an RGB histogram to me is invaluable. I love it. Yes. That is to me is going to be worth it. Here's what I don't understand though. Subscription models to me speak to regular updates, right? I'm paying. Yes, usually. You're going to give me regular updates. It sounds like this is a pretty baked in, really well featured photography app. Yeah, but it's, What are you going to give me over time that I shouldn't just pay you a, make it 20 bucks and then charge when you do a version two like Tweetbot does. Right. But why subscription? Mm. That's a good question. Um, it does make you wonder what can be updated. Because uh, if you're using this on your iPhone 11 Pro X, what is it, what is it called? Max. I mean, Max. Okay, if you're using it on your iPhone, I am not an iPhone guy, I'm sorry. No, you've got your what? Pixel 4, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're using it on your iPhone 11 Pro Max, what else can they update on that throughout the year or throughout the next couple of years? Say you keep your phone for three years instead of two. You know, but you're still paying the eight dollars a year. I guess that, that that is a good question. What exactly can you update that says, all right, this is this is worth it for a subscription base versus just a flat twenty dollar fee? The way they did the whole yeah. video side. Yeah, the video one isn't oh, maybe maybe this is a sign the video one's gonna go subscription. Oh, I hope boy. not. Better not. <laughs> Cause it works fine. Well, right remember, now. they're the demo. Filmic yeah. Pro was the demo at um, at the, the announcement for iPhone 11 yep. Pro, uh, where they showed it recording all four cameras at one time. Yep, they're setting it up, use it, utilizing them all. Mm. Maybe that'll be a subscription feature. That'll break my heart. Oh boy, I don't know. We shall see. We shall see. I like how you said it. That'll break my heart. <laughs> kind of sound like a song. <laughs> yeah, breaking country, into it's got to be a country break song. Break my probably. heart. <laughs> All right. So now we've gotten all of our news and rumors out of the way. I want to dive in a little bit on Mr. 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 Brazel. So first and foremost, head on over to to behind the shot TV and be sure to check out his podcast. He's been doing some unbelievable interviews with other photographers around the world and breaking down what's been going on with with particular shots that they've been been working on. And it's just a fascinating perspective and a fascinating point of view that you'll get from the photographer versus what Mr. Brazel has been sharing when he takes a look at that shot. So it's nice to see the contrast because sometimes he's going to see something totally different from what the photographer saw. So mm -hmm. that's the beauty of those discussions. Um, secondly, I, I wanted to sort of get a little more background from you, Mr. Brazel, because what I know about you is you're an IT guy at heart. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Old so, school MCSE. I got my first MCSE on Windows NT351. Wow. So this is an IT guy that is now a top-notch, outstanding concert photographer. How in the world did you go from staring at bits and bytes <laughs> to staring at pixels? <laughs> yeah, it's probably like you. I mean, it, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting transition, but being in IT... And I know a number of live music photographers, now they think of it, mm -hmm. that are high-end IT people. Mm. Because geek is geek, uh -huh. right? And I came to photography late. I came to photography because my son was in a marching band in high school on a high school football field in drum line, and I wanted to take pictures. Yeah. And I went in and you know, said to the guy, I need, a, I need something that will let me take pictures of him down there. Had I known in my earlier days, before I had children, how much tech and geek there is in photography, I probably would have been in it earlier. Right. Because I think that's some of the funnest part is the software and the hardware mixing and, and understanding exposure triangles at the mm -hmm. right level. Mm -hmm. um, 
I just think to me, it's if you, if you're a geek, the odds are you would like photography. And it's funny you say that because I've heard this mentioned on some other podcasts that I've listened to. And I've, I've seen this in just general conversations that I've had with people uh, just out, you know, outside of work or what have you that are IT minded. And I think it's just the way a, a, a technical person is wired, if you will, no pun intended. Um, first and foremost, we like process and procedure. Uh-huh. You know, we, 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 we love going through, okay, this, if I flip this button, what's going to happen? All right. So now why did that happen? So we will dig in to the why and figure out the process and mm-hmm. procedure. That's of that. so good. You know, so next you put a camera in our hands and we're sitting outside at high noon and we snap that, that shot of somebody out on the bench versus snapping that shot at 4 PM. We're going to ask, why did that happen? <laughs> and, Every single IT person that I know, they have either gotten into photography or they've gotten into some sort of art form because they can put their hands on it and it's tangible and can figure out the why a little bit better and understand the why this looks the way it looks or works the way it works. Is that how you I think you it's feel? a different analytics too. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think photographers that aren't geeks, and I do know some, mm-hmm. that don't even understand their camera well, and, and it's always amazing to me sometimes. <laughs> well, if that's hand. the case, you're, you're who I'm talking about because I know photographers who aren't into geekery tech stuff uh-huh. that are amazing artists, right? right? Like right. if that's you, Michael, because your work is amazing, oh, yeah. right? He's crushing it. <laughs> but what will happen is they take pictures and if they don't work, okay, well, I've got another one that does. Yeah. You and I, on the other hand, Ant, we won't, we, we won't guessing, sleep that night. <laughs> no, we will look at that picture and analyze what did I do wrong? Mm-hmm. What could I do differently? It's a different mindset. It mm-hmm. is. It is. And 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 I'm 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 grateful for that for my IT background. The Twit listeners know that I I worked in enterprise IT for 15 16 years before going full bore into the creative arts. And I'm thankful for just that type of mindset that I have from time to time because yeah, there there's times when I miss the shot that I know I should have gotten. And, and, it, and it'll eat at me. It'll just, oh, what did I do? And then I figured out, okay, and I'll make notes and I won't do that again. Yeah, it's you know? interesting. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm hearing what you guys are talking about. <laughs> I'm thinking I, I, I'm such a visual person that I need to be a little bit more spontaneous. Mm-hmm. And that if there's like, like you're talking about a moment, that that moment needs to be, I mean, I need to dial in that camera dial in my um, composition yep. and just shoot. Yeah. And it's what, all from feeling. It is. It really is. And uh, and it's one of those things that I, I if I start getting technical, I'm going to lose that shot. That shot's going to be gone and I'm not going to well, be able to. The I, thing but, is. But, maybe, but, but the thing is, if you have your camera all dialed in and whatnot and that you're, uh, sorry. I didn't do no, you're good. And, um, and that you're able to kind of manipulate the, the camera in the way um, that's IT-ish. Right. Then, you know, whatever works, IT-ish. works, right? And, and, and well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Maybe that's I, the show I am title. definitely IT-ish. not. I have, that's the, <laughs> I forget the three men in the cap. Yeah, it's IT-ish. <laughs> but no, no, I see, I get that, Wolves, because um, people have asked me in the past when, when I would do like live streams of post-processing, um, what what I pull up in in the in the raw image is it ends up being totally different in post mm-hmm. because when I'm shooting I I have emotion right as I'm shooting it. and that's the thing you need to follow right and so I'm shooting that and I'm and I feel whatever it is now granted I shoot in manual ninety nine percent of the time mm-hmm. so I am adjusting exposure and shutter speed whatever right, yeah you know so I, I I totally get where you're coming from but at the same time the it technical procedural person in me uh-huh. can't really let go. It's know? like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the back end of the thought, right? No, I'm yeah, serious. Like when you get is. back into your, um, the monitor, mm-hmm. you start looking at what could be different and how could every single time, which it makes every sense, which time. makes sense. So, I, okay. <laughs> Therefore I do understand. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. That, but you're, cre- I, I, I think in some ways your style I don't want to say can be more creative. That's not what I mean, yeah. but I think it's what I mean, but it's, I, I think it's more organic, right? Mm-hmm. which I think has advantages I wish I had. Amen, brother. 
Well, I think the thing is that, uh, too, is that when you're looking at the back end, like you're doing your posts, <clears throat> um, one thing I try not to do is um, uh, over post the image. Yeah, over process it. Right. And yeah. really, whatever was caught at that moment, try to preserve it. Right. Because you're really trying to, for me, trying to preserve that one story. Depending on the mood, mm -hmm. but I agree. Right. Depending on the mood. Exactly right. Or mm -hmm. depending on what you're shooting for or who you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you're shooting... Yeah, I was, I was going to say depending on your intent. I mean, exactly I know right. people, uh, Renee Robin, who create works of art, quite much of it in post. Right. So it depends on what your intent is. But yes, it, it, the Aaron root Nace. is still that original photograph. Mm -hmm. Aaron Nace is another one. Aaron Nace is another one. Yeah, the mm -hmm. image I did with him on my show was just... Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. a good one. What that's was the image? One. It was a composition of uh, a little little boy out in the street mm -hmm. with a flashlight and a big furry teddy bear in the background. Oh. And when you look at it, that, they're playing that, hide and seek. Oh, how that fun is that? teddy bear is their mascot, Baxter. Yep, Baxter. <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's just it, the way he did when, it. Was, when he tells you things he did in that image that you don't know because he's so darn good yeah. that you can't see his work, mm. it's it literally is jaw-dropping What how he made that it's shot. Really, okay. really he's really, really good. He's so good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to reach out to have him on FOP here soon. Oh, sweet. So, yeah. So we'll be able to pick his brain some. Good. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to touch on that because, I, like I said, he... Steve is a, a, a IT guy at heart, and I don't think people can just let that stuff go. Now, granted, I'm an IT guy at heart. I don't have any intention of working on any of these machines here at Twit, but at the same time, <laughs> but at the same time, I, I, I get it. I, I get procedure, and I, I, I get the technical side of it. So I'm never going to let that go. But Steve, looking at your images of, of the bands and uh, the musicians, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't see the IT. I see emotion. I see really being able to capture that moment. And that's I appreciate that you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd love to see you work. Is, the IT is in there. Right, because I'm not looking through a viewfinder without always thinking, and I guess landscape and everybody, other good photographers mm -hmm. do this too. But I'm analyzing: is a microphone stand coming out of their head? Right, mm -hmm. is their head in a clean spot? Oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Am I um, on the right side? Because this composition if side, yeah. If he sings with the mic in his left hand, am I on the right side where I can actually yeah, get his that's face? That's all analytic. Okay, oh, very, very research good. Okay. in advance. It's everything in its place. Dude. And Ant actually hit it, and that is when you research a band and you realize this. When you watch reality singing shows, the, the amateurs are switching hands with the mic all the time. Mm -hmm. Most pros have a dominant hand for the mic. And if they're singing with their right hand up to their mouth, you don't want to be on their right side and get the back of their hand. Mm -hmm. You want to be on the other side. Yeah. That to me is almost an IT analytics yeah. level. Do you uh, study or do you, uh, are you familiar with Jim Mitch, uh, Marshall? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was wondering who's your mentors in regards to, uh, or who have you looked at, looked to, to kind of. Well, I mean the Jim by. Marshalls and, Neil Preston's and Baron Woolman's, all of those. The, the biggest mentor to me right now probably is is Alan Hess or Christy Goodwin. Oh, or okay. Adam, or Adam L. Machias. Probably those three. Oh, uh -huh. I got to meet Mr. Hess. I, I totally fanboyed on him. I'm sorry. He Mr. wrote Hess. the book. <laughs> <laughs> fanboy? Met, yeah, I, I met him last week and totally fanboyed on him. I'm <laughs> sorry, really? Mr. Hess. That's yes, good. I did. When you see him again, tell him I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I will. He's a good dude. Yeah, and I, I just really, I absolutely loved. And then, when do you, um, when do you go from black and white to color? So you have a mix of that in your in your work. And so, mm -hmm. when do you decide to go black and white, and when do you decide to keep color? Or that's, that's actually a really good question because in music photography, it's different. Uh, it's not, but it is. When when you have a concert where it's solid red or solid green lighting or solid oh. blue lighting, mm -hmm. for example, red lighting, we'll use Rob Zombie. Red lighting will clip on a sensor faster than almost any other color. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you can end up with just this flat red face that has zero yeah, detail in it. It, it looks clipped and people in the real world would throw it away. Mm -hmm. But the truth is there's plenty of detail left in the green and blue channel. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you switch to black and white and the detail and the tattoos and the, the veins and everything come back. And everybody thinks in music photography, if it's black and white, it was saving the picture from a color issue. 
It's not always the case. No. I use black and white a lot like anybody else would. If I want to strip the if I want to strip the story down to the shapes yep. mm -hmm. Take it to black of the white. image, the color's a distraction for that. You know, the one image that uh, can pops up to mind of yours is the the crowd shot and the guy who's actually up by himself, kind of well you not know, kind of in He's the one that's pretty much in focus. He, everything mm -hmm. else is in focus, but he seems to be the that guy. And I can't remember, is that black and white? But it doesn't matter if it is black, yeah, and, white, black but, and white. But the thing is that it is one of those uh, images that, okay, cross shots really do matter. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that you can really get a, a, a feeling. I don't know, it's a beautiful shot. And also the Thank shot you. from behind Oh, the uh, one that's color. Is, oh, the man. color with the hands up in the air yeah. and uh, the and the stages in the front. That one's hot. Yep. <laughs> really, yeah. Super that black cool. and white one is Cage the Elephant, and and most people think it's Mick Jagger, so I actually titled it not Mick Jagger, <laughs> just to be sure, just to be sure. Yeah, really awesome work. I, I, I I'm you, a man. huge fan. All right. Well, we're going to uh, go ahead and wrap up this week's uh, episode of Focus on Photography. What? It's already finished? It's, it's, yeah, I mean, That man. was an hour? Actually, we've, Gosh, gone, I can't... we've gone overtime. Holy uh -oh. moly. I'm, uh -oh. oops, I'm sorry, Blame me, listeners. No, <laughs> no, it, this was great. And the thing is, we're actually going to have some bonus footage uh, or bonus uh, audio at the end of this episode. Uh, I had an outstanding chat with uh, Mr. Patrick Palmer of Adobe. Oh, he's the uh, mm -hmm. principal. He's the principal product manager over the video side of things. Mm -hmm. And I know you shoot video. Right. I do video. I like to edit video even more because again, that whole IT side. I mean, you know, you, actually, you, we've already talked about this. Editing video is fun. <laughs> I actually love that. But but I had a, I had an outstanding conversation with him. I didn't get the video it, but we did do the audio. The audio sounds great. So that's going to be some bonus footage for our listeners to just check that out. But um, before we go, Mr. Steve Brazel, tell any and everybody listening to this podcast where can they find you and your work. And what you got coming up next? Uh, they can find me at stevebrazel.com. And it's the same as the country Brazil, but two L's. And you pronounced it right, which is virtual hug. <laughs> oh, trust, uh, trust, trust me, never I've, gets been pronounced right. uh, I've been practicing. I've been practicing. On Twitter and Instagram, it's Steve Brazel. And then the podcast is behindtheshot.tv. And uh, just always working on shows and, and getting, <clears throat> you know, new new guests up. I've got Dave Williams coming up on the show. Who's a, an instructor at Photoshop world and a, and a great travel and landscape photographer. And I've got a Nat Geo photographer coming up, Chris Rainier, who just came out with a new book called mask. That's, that's insane. And we're going to talk about one of the pictures oh, in that. Man. Um, oh, man. and that's pretty much it. Nice, 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 nice full, uh, setup that you have coming up oh yeah he, he's gonna be busy for a little while yeah. oh yeah <laughs> i only release every two weeks I, oh. I don't have you guys have to go every week every week it's so what's the um what's the next band you're gonna be shooting i'm doing an unusual one i work at a rock radio station and i, I shoot for the radio station oh sweet and uh so normally i only get to shoot rock but the venue in town has hired me to shoot Snoop Dogg coming up in early nice. December. Nice. Oh and my I'm goodness. super excited about it because it's Snoop Dogg. Oh, Holy my God. Holy moly. Oh, I could yeah. totally visualize that now. <laughs> I want to go on the tour bus so bad. <laughs> so real? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you do it like Anna Leibowitz where she actually toured with Mick Jagger and those guys. Oh, yeah. my goodness. That was, Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be so can much fun. Can you imagine fun. spending a day with Snoop? I just can't even imagine. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You're, uh, you're going to have some stories either way, my man. Your life will Definitely. never be the same. Definitely. Uh, I'm hoping. Well, nice. But thank you again, Mr. Browser. We really appreciate you coming on and uh, hanging out with us here on FOP. I, I can't say thank you enough. It's been my <laughs> honor to be with you too. I, I've loved listening to the first episodes and, uh, yeah, just you guys are doing good work. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, man. Now, don't be surprised if I ask to have you back on in a future episode. Is that cool? Yes, please. All right. See, I got, nice. you. See, I got them on air, folks. I got them saying <laughs> it on air, so we're good. Yeah. Nod to my producers over here. All right, uh, Mr. Wools, where do we find you, and what are you working on before we get out of here? Actually, so I am made up my mind that I'm going to follow through with a project that's about the American flag. Yeah, and so I would do it for my birthday. My birthday is 11, 11. Um, anyway, so yeah, from <laughs> fair last, enough. Yeah, know, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and then so uh, for the full year, I'm gonna um, complete um, this uh, project, and oh, I'll nice. say more about it later. But I just um, 
it's very exciting and it's um yeah anyways nice. very philosophical but vi uh, visual and and beautiful and what is your instagram handle at, at hey wolves at and H E Y W O O L S. And what about Twitter? You're on Twitter too, right? right? You're introducing me to Twitter, man. <laughs> I, swear to God. I tagged him this morning. Yeah, you so did. Thank there. you so much. And uh, um, I, I, I got, I got to, uh, I'm got to tell you, I need to learn Twitter. Yeah, it, I, I, it's, uh, it's different. Twitter. I don't know how much time you have, but I just have to say, Twitter is my favorite social media. It's the ability to text somebody whose phone number you would never have. Exactly. Nice. Okay, good. Exactly. And actually, so um, I'm at same same with um, Twitter. At hey, hey Wolves. Wolves. All right. Sweet. And I am Ant underscore Pruitt on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, just, yeah, Ant underscore Pruitt. I think those are only two social networks I use. Oh, and LinkedIn, but never mind that for now. Uh, <laughs> never mind that for now. Thank you all for, for tuning in to this week's uh, episode of Focus on Photography. If you're hearing this for the very first time, folks, go ahead and hit subscribe on your favorite podcatcher of choice. Or if it's on YouTube, hit subscribe there too. We'd really appreciate that support. Uh, thank you to my man, Mr. John A and Mr. John S that always makes us look and sound great in the beautiful twit. Eastside Studios. This is a great studio. Thank you again to Mr. Wolves hanging out with me each and every week. Find Focus on Photography here on twit.tv every Thursday recording live at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I don't know what time that is, Eastern Standard Time and UTCs, but you can look it up uh, from there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Stop laughing at me. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. But thank you all again. Seriously, we really do appreciate the support. And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to just tag any of us here on Twitter with your questions and feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Be sure to check out our Twit online forums. That's twit.community in your browser. Hop on in there and check out some of the things that we're talking about, whether it's photography or tech or just general day-to-day -day stuff, books people are reading and so forth. It's a really, really nice online community. And also follow Twit on Twitter and Instagram. That is at twit.tv. Thank you again, folks. We will catch you on the next episode, but stay tuned for that bonus clip right about now. Take care. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, guys. Mr. Patrick Palmer, uh, as his card says, principal, product manager, professional video and audio. But that's for me, that just words. says uh, Premiere Pro. Yes. That's, that's, that's just what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> that's totally cool. How you doing? I actually also look after media and coder, but... Oh, and uh, A&E. A &E. Okay. Okay. Very and good. By implication, as we have so many connected workflows, right. you know, things like Mogus don't exist in isolation. So while I'm not managing After Effects, I'm certainly part of the conversation about all the things that go oh, into Premiere Pro. Okay, yeah, that's. I bet you have some very interesting meetings every quarter. Uh, <laughs> quality would be fine. <laughs> it's actually it's it's a fun job these days. There's right. so many things that used to be isolated come together in one place. Right. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy that. Doing Premiere Pro at this point definitely means to see what's at the heart of video creation. Right. It's not just oh okay I'll edit and then somebody else is going to do their thing. Oh no. Uh, we have so many people who basically perform everything. Mm -hmm. Start to finish and then if you do have a collaborator the perspective has totally changed in mm. terms of what that's going to look like and right. where you're getting additional material source from how you how you create any kind of intro up, even with small crews right just mention the motion graphics templates that's that's been actually the, the most fun story to watch how that did unfold over time i wanted to touch on that because i can remember when i got started with premiere pro maybe seven or eight years ago mm -hmm. and the first time I did my video, it was horrible because <laughs> they always are. I was going to say that every first video you is know, horrible. They're, 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 it was horrible. It's good to admit to it. Yeah. And, 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 and then I saw another video of somebody and they had graphics pop up on the screen and it just And moved. all of a sudden it and looked so much better, didn't it? I was like, it? that looks yeah. great. How yeah, do I yeah. do that? And I couldn't do it in Premiere Pro at the yeah. time, not to that level. Yeah. And everybody said, go into After Effects. I open After Effects and, and that's faint a whole it. another level. Right? I faint it. And it's a whole like, different kind of creative, right? Frankly. And so I knew right then I'll never be good enough to do these types of graphics on my video. But you know, move yeah. down the road some years, yeah. we have yeah. templates now that can help 
pretty much anybody just drag and drop and type it in. Yeah. What, what was the thought process on that? Because some people would feel like you're cannibalizing After Effects mm -hmm. and its power mm -hmm. to benefit the users of yeah. Premiere Pro. What are your thoughts on that? I actually think we did pretty much the opposite. We unfolded all of the power of After Effects and made it available to editors who otherwise either would not have had the time to get to this level of quality and graphics right. or not the passion for it, but certainly the need right. uh, or were quite frankly scared of the thought of crafting something that actually sits in another department in terms of what kind of creativity you bring to the game if you're a fantastic motion designer. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It is just different enough to think of it this way that instead of saying you're going to learn all of it, and right. audio would be similar and color to a certain degree as well, instead right. of trying to be good at everything, why not actually source from people who are really passionate about that, that, that kind of craft right. and then indeed templatize it, but templatize it in a way that is so easily accessible and customizable that it's not like we're all using the same template at this point. Right, because that so, was the thing. When you say templates, you could look up, um, look at resumes for people. Right. Do people still use resumes? Uh, unfortunately, yes. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's resume at one point in it the It looked early, the same, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You got the same tip from the website. And, and yeah. I, I didn't think that would work with creativity. You know, I so totally I had this you. whole, I had this whole yeah. little issue when it said mm -hmm. motion graphics template thinking uh, mine is just going to look like the next person yeah. out there that's trying to get something started but you guys went just a little bit further to allow you to go ahead and put a diff couple different changes in it there. had it had really kind of two basic concepts already built into the fundamentals there yeah. right uh, for one thing adobe stock is definitely part of the conversation we made sure that there is nicely curated content out there right uh and a lot of it so right. indeed you wouldn't run into the problem that everything just looks the same because we're all in the same, right. same three templates <laughs> from the 50 that right. actually look any good, right? So we have right. a lot of really great content on stock. That's that's one part of the story that really worked super well. Right. If, if nothing else, even if, you're, if you might not be licensing some of it, it's good for inspiration. There is enough free uh, Mogurts. That's happened to me a couple right. of times. I'd right. look at something on stock or what have you and, and, and get an just idea sort of, from it. Right, right just yeah. sort of remixed it. Yeah, myself. totally. And that, that actually was part of, of the game from the get-go that we said we don't necessarily need to put out millions of these but enough right for those who just need something that looks great and to be customized enough so it would be unique again and for others to be inspired and then quite frankly as I said cannibalizing After Effects um, we were actually totally cool with the thought of giving After Effects artists a different kind of perspective to become part of a crew or indeed right. uh, even putting their own things out to stock quite frankly right. Um, as you, you're changing the conversation of After Effects being a collaborator, as it used to be, for, just for supplemental graphics, towards becoming an author. The templates have an authoring process, gotcha. and that's really different from saying you've got access to all the tools, because at that point in time, if you know somebody who's really good at this, mm -hmm. you just get a couple of those templates, make it yours, right? Make sure right. that your brand is reflected with it, whether that's just you or a small group, or if it's it's part of indeed a brand exercise, right. uh, all the way actually to, to the largest scale media outlets in the world, right? They're all using it right. for different reasons and in different ways, but the logic behind it is just the same. You author something and then you recycle, reuse, repurpose mm -hmm. un until you make a major shift right. and then you go back to the author. Yeah, right? yeah. In a, a battle with going back and forth between After Effects and Premiere Pro, but what I've learned is, is Adobe is still trying to put a lot of things right there in front of me inside of Premiere Pro to make this project not just average, you know, mm -hmm. go above average and, mm -hmm. and try to work your way up to being polished of, of the way the big cinema stars are and things like that. So looking at, say, the color side of mm -hmm. it, Adobe clearly has competition with the folks at running Resolve. Sure, it's not the now, only competition, by or, the way. Right, right. right. But that's like <laughs> one of the most popular ones because yeah. it can start it out for free and so on sure. and so forth. You know, it, it's easy for people to access sure. it because it's free. I, you know, and it's credible too, right? Let's face it. Right. You know, so when you all are going through and looking at your different mm -hmm. panels and modules mm -hmm. inside of, of Premiere Pro, yeah. What's the approach? Are you saying, it's, all right, let's look at what they're doing and how we can do it better, or is it sort of a... It's actually very different. Right. I like that question a lot, because uh, if you look at the path that we put the product on, mm -hmm. right around when you started using it, 
right? The essential panels that we have today didn't exist back in the day, right? right? So in Lumetri, for what it's worth, even though it's not called, if, if you right. want to simplify the construct there, there is an essential color, there is an essential sound, and then there is an essential graphics. Right. Only two of them carry the name. But right. <laughs> if you look at the spirit of what they do, they're actually quite similar, right? right. It's actually rationalizing an otherwise really complex conversation right. where barrier to entry is massive. Right. And this is why uh, looking at many of the other products out there, including, by the way, tons of plugins, and they all have reason to exist, right. specifically around After Effects, you wouldn't believe how many color plugins are out there. Right. They do different things for a different kind of mindset, which is why there are so many. Mm -hmm. right? They're not quite universal enough for an editor to say, oh, okay, I get it, I can do this too. Speaking of high quality, consistent looks throughout right. the project. That was actually the idea around Boometry. We had never any thought of saying, this is the thing that the couple of hundred folks who do feature film around the world will rely upon every day and own that market. Mm -hmm. Premiere by definition is a mass market product. Right. It actually helped to democratize the space. So we almost against its purpose to say, right. we're not going to focus on tools that can be used to its full extent by a very small crowd out there. Right? Mm -hmm. And then if it's used by a lot more people, shouldn't the user interface be catering to the need of, well, that, a lot more right. people. Right, right. So that's why the similarities to Lightroom are certainly not uh, an accident. That's right. by intention. Right? Right. What we had in Premiere before was actually also somewhat powerful in many ways, but just way it different. Was different. Way different. <laughs> it, and, and a lot of people are crossing over, right? For a lot of people, it's, it's kind of, it starts out with photography, yeah. and then it expands the video sometimes quickly. Yeah. Some people now start out on video as, as we're in the age of video at this point, right? Let's face right. it. Things have changed Everything in the last couple of years like really that. dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, not to say, can you still actually just say, I'm going to do just photography? Some people can. We've seen Dave LaChapelle this morning. And, right. You know, you're in awe as to what these people can do. Yeah, sure enough. No one's going to say, please do some video on the side. Right. But for right, everybody right. else. <laughs> <laughs> people like me, yeah, you better have a couple couple of different cards in your deck. Yeah. You know, and so, so it's catering to exactly that notion that you, you shouldn't start from scratch for one thing. If you cross over from the photography world, which at this point still is massively mm -hmm. bigger than anything video, right? Right, it you is. Say mass it's bigger, right? Right. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I need to adjust to the change of the last couple of years myself, right? <laughs> video has grown so much at this point, mm -hmm. both in terms of professional production as well as in, in terms of accessibility for everybody else. Everybody right? can do it on the phone. Which is why too. eventually, you know, we looked at a product such as Rush right. for that reason. How can you not try to capture some of that, still up-leveling to a professional level in terms of quality, but mm -hmm. making it more accessible? So the whole Lumetri store, and even if you look at Rush, good example, it has a Lumetri panel. Right. It's it's a bit more basic than what you see in Premiere Pro. Right, but that fits for a touch interface. It does. And it fits and it, for a certain it translates type of directly. user. Exactly, yeah. it translates directly into what you see in Premiere Pro if you then push it further down the road. And mm -hmm. if you decide that you actually need to take a couple more twists and tweaks and, and polish. Right. right. You can. That's one of the things that I love about Rush. I actually mm -hmm. love to create on the phone, mm -hmm. but there are limits to what you want to do on the phone. And by the way, some things are actually even nicer and faster and better yeah. than anything right. that, you, that touch has, has a certain appeal to it, as we've seen with the uh, uh, Photoshop for iPad. And right. There are some things that I don't think I want to do again ever mm -hmm. in my life mm -hmm. on anything but a touch surface. There's mm -hmm. stuff that is so nice and intuitive if your pen is actually going over the image and not onto a right. tablet that sits next to you seeing the, the cursor move right. someplace else. There's right. this, this intuitiveness is awesome. And you see some similar tactile. things there. Tactile. Totally tactile, mm -hmm. right? So all of that explains why our focus was actually not necessarily to say it's every feature in the world that ever has been part of, of a color grading system. Mm -hmm. How many people will be able to use all of it? That was okay. the basic question. Right. Right? Right. And at this point, by the way, we already have some really sophisticated things like the curves that are clearly catering to the more high-end colors mm -hmm. inside the editing crowd. Hue set, hue lumetry. Right? Yeah, it takes a little bit, bit of time to think about what that does, why it exists in the first place, but we wanted to create something where people can aspire towards something that goes beyond the reach that they already have. Mm -hmm. And the curves are a pretty good example. That's why they're designed differently from anything else you see right. in either of the other products. Right. Uh, that's why you see actually what they're doing inside the user interface. If you push hue right. set, you'll immediately see where the saturation on that hue is going. Mm -hmm. So it, it relates to what you see on screen, right. other than most other systems that are kind of, you know, a little bit of gray into right. another kind of gray in terms of the tool itself. So right. it doesn't tell you anything about its purpose. Right, that's true. I do I do enjoy that. I'm, I'm still battling with that 
for lack of a better term, learning curve with mm. the new, mm. the new <laughs> Hugh Hughes and Hugh Sat. I'm mm. still battling with it a little bit, mm. but it's I can see its power. Um, two more things I want to mm. touch on. Uh, first and foremost, AI. Mm -hmm. Adobe doubled down on AI a handful of years ago mm. and haven't really looked back ever since. Um, yeah. My first reaction to AI and creativity, I thought it How was can they combine? baloney. I was like, no, that's not going to work. But um, from a photography standpoint, Adobe has proven me wrong mm. because it makes so much more sense to allow the AI to do the repeatable task for me. The meticulous work. Right. So now with yeah. video, we're seeing the release of the auto reframe mm -hmm. and um, the spirit is the same. The color Get match. The and, work out. You know, so can we expect to see more and more of that down we're, the road? Or we're just absolutely. at the tip of the iceberg? I think it is the tip of the iceberg. Right? Okay. Exactly. There's just enough ready now for those features and workflows to become truly useful. If mm -hmm. you just get some things done but largely it's off and you need to do too much manual recovery mm -hmm. it doesn't really make sense to use AI just because it's labeled AI it doesn't mean anything right right but if it's getting you 90% uh, of the way towards a really clean and nice result that's usually when it starts to become interesting 99% yeah, exactly. by the way as, as some people quote I don't think that's ever interesting you still would want to watch whatever the machine thought is a good good idea mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, repetitive tasks mm -hmm. for sure, right? Photoshop example is the same thing. Right. It will actually do a great job most of the time. There will be times when you actually want to go in, and that's why it's so easy to change right. that and to know, just change fine the tune it, fine -tune it a little. Bit. A little. Mm -hmm. But that's I think that's exactly the point about it. Fine tuning is actually fun because attention to detail is what most creatives right. love to bring to the game. Right. 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 Um, but would you want to do all of the legwork to even get to the part where you can fine tune? And the answer is always. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually, I think it's fun as an exercise when you get started, mm -hmm. but as soon as you know how it's done and you know you get a good result by putting in the hours, it's no fun to do that right. part of the work anymore. It's, it's fun to think about what you want out of that picture, why you knock out a certain right. thing, why you want to get rid of the background. Right. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's actually liberating mm -hmm. to have these features come in and just do some of the work because truly, and we keep saying that for good reason. This is not replacing creativity. It's no. actually empowering creativity. Yeah, I will say this. I had a job uh, last year covering CES. Uh -huh. And there was a, a, just some video that I had to shoot. And for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I flipped my white balance in camera. Uh -huh. Didn't remember doing that. No one else has ever encountered that problem. <laughs> and I'm like, what? So I'm going through this and scrubbing it, and I'm like, what the heck is wrong here? And I'm like, the white balance is off. So I'm manually trying to fix it. Mm. And then I remember, oh, there's a tool. Did it work? Oh, it was magical. It brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it saved me so much time. That's awesome. And it allowed me to, you know, mark that job as done. Right. So I can create so that nice. invoice <laughs> <laughs> and move on to the next job. That's yeah. that's what I'm seeing with AI now. I didn't yeah. see that at first, but I'm seeing that now with AI and creativity. It's just allowing me to get my jobs done a little bit faster so I can do more jobs. That's that's pretty much it. Or if in doubt if you have a time box, if you know you can spend a certain amount of hours in a project, it actually allows to up the quality. And I yep. think that's equally interesting. It does. If, if you can basically show to your customer that you can deliver something that really stands out. Right. Uh, I agree. I'm kind of hoping that it will not exclusively lead to deadlines that are even more tight than they already are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and par partially it's going to happen, right? Let's, let's face it, that's the reality of it. It is what it is. Um, but <laughs> at, at one point in time, Specifically, when we're talking about brands, they need to stand out. That's that's the reason why you're being hired to create something for them in the first place. Right. And so, having extra time to spend on something that makes the difference mm -hmm. and, and that creates that extra, that little something that the machine can't the do it, for you, right? The it factor. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. I totally get it. I totally get it. All right. So I my actually personally think you see that reflected in, in what's out there on, on YouTube channels these days. Sure enough, there's still a lot of do-it-yourself videos, jump cuts, and sometimes, by the way, if you take a closer look, even those are, are meticulously manufactured now at this point. Right. right? So right. There's, 
that's an art in itself. Right. And you shouldn't actually look down to it saying, well, they didn't know any better. Well, right. that, that's well classed. Sometimes at this point. it's on but purpose, yeah. Some other things, like I've just seen a travel show by Valentina V um, last night almost by accident and thought, oh my. <laughs> they did that with the Fuji X-T3 a right. couple of lenses that most people would call average right right. just I actually think good lenses but for what it's worth if you look at cine quality lenses what people would usually bring to the game when they're on a hundred million dollar budget movie yeah. that thing looks so fantastic right. that I would say if you were to present that to me on Netflix today and would ask me for a rating, I'd give it a five-star rating because it looks nice. awesome, the story is fantastic, it has a very nice motion feel to it. It's interesting to see how far people can take it with right. basically no gear, right. great ideas, and, and still a just little bit of time. Push the envelope with, by each, you know, each little slider at a time. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. Can you relate to the story that I, that girl told earlier today? Oh, yeah. I can totally relate to that. The, the self-taught aspect I, to it. You I, don't know what you're doing wrong, and that's a great thing at times. <laughs> see, with me, I started with photography, and I used to have this little part and shoot camera. I think it was a Sony camera. Uh huh. But what really got me into photography was my phone at the time. Interesting. And so I was digging into that phone and trying to figure out the settings. And you remember what kind of phone it was? Yes, it was a Droid X. Long time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> wow, okay. So the camera wasn't the It wasn't great, but it got my attention. Yeah. And so I decided to get into photography huh. and bought a little uh, Rebel, Canon Rebel. Uh-huh. Played around with that. I didn't read a book, but I just messed with the settings uh. every day. I would take a glass of something yeah. in the house, take a picture of it change a setting take it again what was, what was the difference you know i i'm self-taught and it i appreciate it more and when i heard what he was saying on the stage i was like yeah, yeah that sounds like a lot of artists that i know out there you know it's just the heart behind it and just putting in the extra effort you know so yeah yeah i totally relate <laughs> sorry last question all right so now this one hits me a little bit in the core because uh -huh. <laughs> I first and foremost, I think I'm one of the few people on the planet that still uses a desktop computer in their edit bay. I have a nice laptop, but uh -huh. when, I'm, when it's time for me to sit down and edit a batch of photos or edit a batch of videos, yeah. I'm at a big rig that I built piece by piece, and I went with the Ryzen platform. Uh -huh. Now, everybody in the world is telling me you need to go with Intel. You need to go with Intel, and I'm thinking. Well, number one, Intel costs way too much money. Mm. Ryzen is going to give me a little bit more bang for the buck, dollar-wise. Mm -hmm. But they will argue with so-called stats and benchmarks mm -hmm. on Intel versus Ryzen architecture. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? What are you mm -hmm. all seeing right here? Is there any type of connection between Premiere and working with the, the AMD people? And We're actually working with all the hardware manufacturers for good reason because, indeed, uh, you might actually have other reasons to be on a specific type of CPU, GPU, right. workstation itself if you buy something rather off the shelf and don't do it yourself. Um, we always wanted to create software products that don't make you think too much about what you need to buy. Uh -huh. uh, with the exception of, yes, it makes a difference whether or not you want something extremely mobile or indeed something that you would put into an edit bay and almost in, inside a closet because it's going to scream and make too much noise. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? there's that. So uh, <laughs> there are choices to be made in terms of, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll create something that I know is lightweight and therefore it, it's not going to do my 6K files Correct. or uh, this is the thing and I'm going to do multi-cam with it and I'll do client sessions with it. That choice is very independent from should it be processor A, B, C, D, X. Um, that said, there are differences, right? And right. we can exploit things on one platform that we can't on the other and vice versa. Okay. We're always going to try to get, here, here's my take on it, we're always going to try to get the best out of each platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is no, no such thing as, oh, we're focused on, on making that thing fantastic and we don't even know about the other. Right? Mm -hmm. There are different advantages and disadvantages and, and you already said it, well, you look at something that look awesome for the price it is mm -hmm. and that's what it should be right? right you shouldn't you shouldn't expect to see that compete with something that everybody else is telling you is the real deal if money is of no concern to you. right and i'm like man they, everybody would, they would throw out the numbers about um benchmarking is multi-threaded multi-threaded yeah. processing and yeah i would 
pull up a video and just mm -hmm. watch it render in encoder mm -hmm. and pull up my task manager just mm -hmm. to see what was happening. And I swear mm -hmm. I have 16 threads mm -hmm. and they were all firing off. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what is this dude talking yeah. about? There, so, are, there are actually some interesting things. I'll, I'll give you a bit of a nerd talk on that one. There's stuff su such as what's called hardware acceleration. And right. that means many different things to many different people, which right. is why it's easily confused. And I see a lot of the confusion out on forums. Um, so sometimes it's actually nice to have a nerd talk about these things. So mm -hmm. hardware acceleration is not GPU acceleration. Those right. two things are somewhat different. So right. what is, well, GPU acceleration is actually pretty easy to explain. So you're basically putting effects. Usually that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's other things. But usually you put effects, some sort of processing of the image right. on the GPU. And the right. faster the GPU and the more things can happen parallel, the faster that's going to right. happen. So Having a great GPU, that's a standard recommendation for, for any video user, really. Having a capable GPU in your system, whether it's mobile or whether it's a workstation, same thing, go for something that has a bit more horsepower. Right. right? And RAM, ideally. Right. Um, then when it comes to hardware acceleration, that's a different thing. That actually specifically refers to, and it comes from consumer tech, oddly enough, refers mm -hmm. to the fact that H.264, HEVC, those two formats right. specifically, uh, can actually work fast with a specific chipset. Uh, that actually isn't the CPU, it's, it's next to it. Right, it's so, on the motherboard. Right, gotcha. right, and actually originally invented right. um, for people who just wanted to have, uh, on a laptop specifically, a couple of hours of Netflix without the battery making you feel like <laughs> this, this thing is gonna melt down your lap and then some, right? That was originally the case. If right. you think about video streaming in the early days, right. when you watch something on YouTube, I'm sure you remember. All right, before Every HTML5, before that. Right, so know. there were some efficiencies brought to the game specifically that, that kind of hardware, and we're tapping into that. And by right. the way, a lot of manufacturers do, we're not exclusive in that. Right. But there are some differences, one platform to the other, but at the end of the day, we're really investing in making sure that you don't actually really have to be concerned about that. Right. There are always other ways of achieving something somewhat similar. So we're trying just to basically get to the to the performance levels. And this, by the by the way, uh, has been this year. And it's continuing to be. You heard Scott say that uh, it, it's an area of focus to make sure that the performance is right, and you don't need right. to worry too much about that. Right. It's definitely increased for me and my workflow. That's, it's gotten that's better cool over the years. Um, it will continue to get better. There are actually really a lot of things in progress right now that make me feel really positive about it. As at the end of the day. That's an interesting shift in terms of where the industry was 10 years ago and where we are today. 10 mm -hmm. years ago, everything was controlled. Everything had a digital intermediate. Everything, you know, everything has been carefully planned towards, I'm going to sit in the edit bay, it's got to be real time. And I do whatever it takes mm -hmm. on the path towards the edit bay to make that happen. Today, right. it's kind of like, okay, I shot that stuff, let's go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's yeah. way much deliberation in the process. And right. um, I'm a huge fan of saying, let's, let's not put more tutorials out there to educate people on how it's been done in the past. And mm -hmm. by the way, for larger organizations, that's still a great idea, right? Unifying workflows is a right. great idea if you have all sorts of inputs. But right. for someone like yourself, who, who wants to run with a new camera mm -hmm. uh, and, and then just immediately start editing, we need to find ways on whatever you, it is you're using to make right. it a pleasant experience. Right. Well, I appreciate your time. I'm going to ask you one bonus question. Oh, cool. you're, pro you're probably not going to answer it. Ah, uh, you know, so, sure. <laughs> so, so today is today is Sneaks Day, yeah. and I've already asked Mr. Josh Haftel the same thing. <laughs> can, can you give me just a sneak peek before? You sneaks? know what's the fascinating thing to me? I will see these sneak peeks for the first time. Oh, come on! <laughs> see, I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> this is this is the best kept secret. At Adobe. I have uh, absolutely no idea what I'm going to see. And there might be audio and video things here on stage today that I, mean, I have no idea. Content of Phil. I remember <laughs> seeing that last year with the horse running. And it's like, well, it's wow. in the product now. Yeah, now it? it's here. So I'm like, okay, maybe he's he can give me a little bit of insight. But of course he didn't answer it. Jeez. Okay. I would love to give you something. I know. No. Uh, I would if I could. It's it's not even like, you know, I'm not allowed to talk about it. I just You just myself. don't know. And I actually quite like that. I I like plausible uh, deniability. Be, it's the same experience <laughs> as the audience. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I get where you're going. All right. Thank you again, Mr. Thank you, I appreciate you now. Thanks for your time.